All right, well, yeah, let's get started here. So, um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the PowerShell tooling session. Uh, my name is Steven Bucher. I am a new uh, PM on the PowerShell team. I joined about six months ago. This is my first conference, first time really meeting uh, a lot of people in person that I've interacted with online. It's, it's, it's great to, to see everyone here and present. And uh, we're here to talk about uh, PowerShell tools, demo some cool stuff that we've released, as well as uh, talk about some things that um, have released in the past couple months. So, and I'm here, of course, with... Uh, Sydney Smith and Jason Helmick uh, of the PowerShell team. They're going to be helping, out, helping me out with some demos today. <clears throat> so to first start off, we kind of wanted to um, talk about the, the vision of PowerShell that we have uh, currently, the improve the lives of folks working on operations by simplifying automation. Um, this was really emphasized in the state of the shell demo, but um, this is our main you know, guiding light um, for all the tooling and all the products that we like to ship. So. Um, drilling into it a little bit more, we have these different pillars of, uh, of themes that we really want to focus on to, in order to achieve uh, the goal of improving people's lives. Um, you know, this, these were kind of talked more in depth in the state of the show, but we really want to focus in on these two here as they're very pertinent to tooling. Um, you know, reduce friction for users adopting new technologies. The world is a messy place and PowerShell tooling uh, helps you clean it up. Um, the tools we develop are, are help to, are invested in to help you reduce the friction uh, for the new technologies that are coming out today. It seems like everything's going such fast pace that uh, it's, it's hard to keep up. And so we try our best to uh, be with the new and, and help you uh, adopt the new in a very familiar PowerShell way. Um, and the next thing is the uh, engineering for agility. You know, the world changes quickly and challenges are immediate. So we build our engineering process for agility. And so um, Jason was telling me this really cool story about how, you know, a couple years ago we get three releases out in, in a year, right? And then no, it's, it's one release. One release. Yeah, some of you guys remember when PowerShell was issued, you get one release about every three years. Yep, one release every three years. But now in the past, um, was it three years? We've had 60 different releases. Is that right? Did I get the numbers right? Um, <laughs> and that's pretty exciting. And so what we love to um, working with uh, in open source and working with the community too is we can get previews in your guys' hands, uh, get bugs filed, issues filed, understand what um, is needed to, to really help you guys uh, do what you need to do with the tools, understand new features, understand new capabilities that we may have not thought of um, so that we're building the tools that really, really help you guys. Um, and so, uh, you know, Jeffrey kind of coined this term of this uh, swimming lanes of innovation. You know, the engine is a small portion of what kind of innovation we have going around PowerShell. Uh, you know, we um, have all these different lanes of, of these different tools that we have. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, there's some myth that, you know, the tooling stuff that's not shipped with PowerShell is not important. And, and that's just not true. Um, you know, we sort of consider each of these different areas uh, to be its own swimming lane. The pacing of each might be a little differently, but ultimately they're all going to bring you to the finish line. Um, and so we like to work in parallel with all these tools. Uh, also, we uh, build for backwards compatibility, and most of all, we like to build for customizability. Is that a real word? I don't know. <laughs> but it, it gets the point across. Um, that you know you don't need every single one of these tools to get the job done. You can use one, you can use a couple, but you can use them together to also help uh, meet your needs uh, um, for for whatever you're working on. <clears throat> and so that I'm going to hand it over to Jason oh. for uh, a crescendo demo. Okay, I, I'm actually not going to demo, but I want to talk about crescendo for a minute. Um, so look, uh, stop reading the slide. I'll get there. So look, this is going to sound creepy, but literally, I wake up in the morning and go to bed at night thinking about you. Your pro I know that's creepy, right? But your problems are my problems, and how do we solve them? There's a problem out there, and everybody yells about it. Hey, how do we get commandlets for X? Well, the process is simple. Contact that team and ask. Good luck. Folks, the world is not going to be commandlets. The world is going to be whatever it is. It's a messy place. So what Crescendo is designed to do is take some of that mess away by allowing you all of those brand new and legacy command line tools that you used in the past. How many of you used IPconfig? Excellent. 
So now you know my frame of reference. All of those native tools. How many of you use Cube Control? How many use Docker? Yeah, see, these aren't going away. What Crescendo does is allow you to quickly wrap those commands so that you can make them into commandlets. And instead of that string data that you can't use in your automation unless you're a regex specialist, you can turn that all into objects. So it works down the pipeline just like it should you would expect as a PowerShell user. Is that kind of cool? You don't look like that's kind of cool, but is that kind of cool? Kind of cool? So here's how this works. Um, you can define, you can define your commandlets in, 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 in JSON. And what I would encourage you all to do is after this session at two o'clock, and I'm sorry, Stevie, wherever you are, but I only know you by your Twitter handle, so Stevie Coaster is doing a crescendo full length demonstration, so go check that out. You easily fill out the JSON file, you run crescendo, and bam, you got your modules, you got whatever commands you decided you wanted to wrap, and you're ready to rock and roll. Now some of you, and I've mentioned this before, some of you already know how to wrap an API yourself, or take a native command and write your own wrapper around it. Great, just go ahead and keep doing that. Crescendo is for the folks that don't know how to do that, and it's for the folks that want to move faster. I work with a lot of internal teams. They use Crescendo right now to prototype their commandlets to make sure they get what they want before they hand it to engineering to code. That way they have a better result when they get it out to the community. That's a brilliant idea in my part. So this is an accelerator, and here's the other best part. We worked really hard to make sure we understood what this problem looks like in the real world. We've lived it, so Crescendo you can download it, it's really easy, from the gallery. You can install it on your system and you can quickly do this. You install it on PowerShell 7. Go like this. Okay, the more, the higher it is, the better off you are. Because I want you to realize you're using two arms for this, PowerShell 7. So you have to author on PowerShell 7, but when you export the module, it's, of course it works on PowerShell 7, but it also works, go like this, on PowerShell 5. So we know that you need to be able to deploy this to servers that are still running Windows PowerShell 5.1. So we made this so that it worked for that. Yay! Okay, you don't sound excited at all. But you can take this, this ugly stuff and make it stuff you're familiar with. Yeah? So I want to show you something really quick about Crescendo, and that's... Hit us, uh, Steven said, hit that, and <laughs> go like this. We have documentation for Crescendo, and I would just want to take you through this just, just really briefly to show you a couple things about this documentation. If you go to uh, the getting started for Crescendo, of course we talk about the installation. Here's all the information you need to know about the installation. You install it, you put it for, for PowerShell 7, but we even got the note there. All your modules exported will work all the way down to Windows PowerShell 5.1. You guys know how to install a module from the gallery, it's a piece of cake. So you just install Microsoft PowerShell Crescendo, you're ready to rock and roll. Nothing else you need to do. Um, at that point, you know, we have in this documentation, by the way, some things you may want to think about. And I'd love to talk to you about the philosophy behind this. If you're interested at some point, come see me. But the idea is this, you should amplify, I like the word amplify because we call it Crescendo, right? To amplify, get, you guys are not. Going. Anyways, we um, were thinking about this and saying, well, the reality of the situation is if you've worked with cube control, if you try to wrap all of cube control, you're going to be doing that for a few weeks because it's huge. So wrap only what you need. Crescendo will let you, hey, you want to use the command and only one of that command's parameters? Crescendo will let you do that. Then you can go back and add it in and all that kind of stuff, sir. The thing that's bothering me about this, Jason, is the duplication of work that we're going to get. The, everybody who uses, you mentioned Q Control, but Docker or Git or anything else, everyone will go and write their own thing. What we could really use is something 
not just the say upload it to the gallery that we've done, but something where somebody says, okay, we've produced a library of these, so we've done ID config, we've done NetShare, and we've done. I look forward to your submission. In other words, we hope that that does happen. But if it's me and ten other people doing it, nine of us are wasting our time. I don't. I disagree with that, but. If you're asking me to go around wrapping all the commands, that's not going to happen. I'd love you to do that. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, and you know, you know just as well that that's not going to happen. This is designed for you as the community to be able to wrap stuff that you need to use. And quite honestly, I know what you're saying, and I totally agree with you. It's, people are going to put five modules of IP config up there, all different. Yep, that's part of the messy place stuff. But the guy that needs to use IP config and their automation on their network doesn't care about that. They're going to wrap it and go. It is going to be messy, but that's kind of part of the, the, the way that it works. Can you repeat the question again? Oh, I didn't repeat the question. Oh, well, I'm, I, you know. I'll try. Uh, let's see. Um, so we also go in here and we show you how to create the commandlets, how to set it up. We give you some advice on things that you might want to think about when you're looking at the native command and you get it wrapped, then you can wrap it, export the module. If you would like, you can publish it to the gallery. And of course, as John uh, O'Neill points out, that's going to uh, make it, everybody's going to have modules up there. If you search for a tag, Crescendo, you will see all of the modules that have been done with Crescendo on the gallery. We, um, when you, when we uh, generate the PSD1, we have a tag in there. You can remove it if you want, but we have a tag in there, so if you put it on the gallery, it can show up with a crescendo search. Does that make sense? Kind of sort of, yeah. Um, and you can create it and run it. It's a pretty simple, straightforward process, which is what we um, really wanted to see. There's the export. You just export it with the JSON, and wham, there you go. So is this something that you need today? Some of you do. Some of you might. It might be something you run into a year or two from now, but I anticipate that there's going to be a lot more uh, command line tools written by all companies. And if you want that PowerShell object in the pipeline experience, this is one way to accelerate and do it. I will point out that, again, if you know how to wrap your own stuff, go ahead and keep doing it that way. This isn't to replace that. This is to help the rest of us out that aren't that good at wrapping our own stuff. And so it generates it for you. Does that sound kind of cool? Well, let me show you something else. We'll take questions at the end here. I, I, I'm already taking way too much time, and I'm going to get yelled at. Um, now I can't figure out how to get this back up. Ah. So here's the link to the docs for it that we have out there. We have more docs to write. We're working on it right now and to fill in some of the gaps. So come on out, take a look. And leave us notes in uh, our GitHub uh, repo and tell us what you like and more importantly, tell us what you don't like and tell us what you think we ought to do because um, we'd really like your feedback. Kind of, sort of? Kind of, sort of? Okay. How many of you work with D uh, DSC? One, two, three, four, okay. So DSC is a configuration management tool platform that will help you uh, do uh, basically configuration as code, right? And it will help you uh, uh, maintain the state of your systems. DSC has been out for a long time. What we've decided to do was uh, start to update DSC. And there was a promise that, that Michael Green made long ago to open source the repo. That was the announcement that we made on Monday. It was so happy to make that announcement that the repo is open source so that we can start taking, those of you that work with DSC that are into this, we can start taking your issues and we can start talking about it and moving forward with DSC. Here's what we have right now. DSC v2 that everybody's been using on Windows PowerShell and all that kind of stuff, it ain't going anywhere. It's not deprecated. It's always going to be there. Right now it's 205. We may issue a 206 soon, but it's always going to be on the gallery. You will always have it. I want you to notice we moved it out of the engine. As Stephen was pointing out, part of the swim lanes of innovation means we have a different life cycle once we're outside of the engine. And we can do rapid life cycles on this stuff. So DSE V2, what you guys have been using, it's always going to be there. DSE V3 is different. 
We wrote this, spent most of our investment helping guest config. Azure Policy Guest Config is a very important team to us. So we started this development stream with them. That's the work that we've done. And it's set up kind of a direction that's different than DSCV2. In DSCV3, and this will only make sense to the people that work with DSC, so I'll be kind of brief on it. There's no more MOF. That's the idea. We're not doing MOFs. And we're not doing script-based resources. We're only doing class-based resources. There is no LCM. There is no pull server. There is invoke DSC resource. You use invoke DSC resource, tell me the resource, give me a property bag, boom. That's your script, send it to the server, off it goes. It's a very streamlined process. With class-based resources, we get better speed and, 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 and development with it. So DSCV3 uh, is, is kind of the direction we go. What we really like is for your feedback on DSC. If you're into configuration management, we're at the position now of we've open sourced it. Our intention to open sourcing it was to ask you to come and play uh, with us and, and, and tell us what we need to be doing about it. And let's have the conversations. Configuration management has changed over the last five years. So we're trying to change with it. So let's have the conversation about it. So if you're into configuration management, come talk to us and, and we'll work on it. Sound kind of cool? Yeah? All right. We can also use all of your help, you DSC people, if you want to review the docs as we're working on them. So we, we've had a lot of doc conversations while we've been here with folks, so we really appreciate it. Cool. Well, let's, let's get into um, another uh, partial tool. So PS Readline History and Completion Predictors. So this was hinted at a little bit at the um, uh, state of the show, but uh, wanted to show off the history-based predictor and our brand new uh, recently released uh, PowerShell tab completer. We, you know, we're releasing it here at the summit um, for you guys to check out, so it's now available. Um, I'm going to switch over here to a PowerShell terminal. Let's see, let's get a fresh, let's get a new one here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Okay, so let me zoom in a bit so you guys can see it. Um, okay, so um, with the newly released uh, GA of PowerShell, or excuse me, PS Reline 2.2, we have this new feature um, that includes the uh, history predictor and the uh, uh, <clears throat> completer predictor. So I'm going to first start out with the history predictor. So um, in order to get this going, um, you need to do set PS read line option predictor source history. So this enables a predictor now that um, as I start typing, it's going to look back on the last command that I've just typed uh, previously in my history. And so you can see it's, it's in this kind of gray, grayed out, not hard to see, there you go. Um, grayed out versions here. So if I, you know, start typing, you know, get process, it, it knows that, you know, the last thing I did and I accept it with my right arrow key, uh, get the process of, of, of PowerShell. And um, this works for, uh, you know, any successful command you've run in the past, uh, you'll be able to see it. Uh, it'll be able to run guaranteed with the, the um, predictor. Uh, another thing that's really cool with this is that, you know, this gray is kind of hard to see with, uh, you know, with this projector here. And so we want, we want to customize that. So we have a uh, built-in customizability, reline, if I can spell, option, color. And so look at that, the predictor already helping me on this last uh, color here. So we'll, we'll change the inline prediction to a, a nice green um, that you guys can see a lot better. <laughs> um, but there, there's all sorts of different ones that we can do. And But you know, there, there's more than one, um, more than one thing I uh, might have typed, or more than one color that I, that I used in the past. So in order to see the list view of it, I'm going to press F2 here. And so as I start typing, you'll see now I have a list view of 10 previous options of what I've typed in the past. So um, I want to switch to a different, let's see what, what, what this color is. This is, oh, well, now i got to switch back to inline view. Oh, so this is a nice highlighted blue um, you know, predictor here. And, and so that's, that's pretty awesome. So I'm going to switch back to the F2 here. And so um, you can see all these past historical predictions given to you. And um, this is pretty awesome. And so uh, what I'm going to do now is change to the, the plugin side of the predictors. Now, um, what's really cool about the history predictors is it really helps accelerate your code. 
um, accelerate your workflow. What's really awesome about these plugin predictors is it really helps enhance it. It gives you something new and uh, helps you with exploration of new commandlets and parameter sets that you may not have ever typed before. Um, and oh, I should also note that the history predictor is um, available in PS Reline uh, one point or two point one plus, and uh, it will be available on uh, Windows PowerShell five one and uh, uh, PowerShell seven x. Um, however, these plugins that I'm going to be demoing here are only available on PowerShell seven x. Um, <laughs> it is, yep. <laughs> um, but uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to utilize the uh, list view predictors to enable the history and plugin feature. Um, and now I'm going to actually import the module uh, for completion predictor. So this is the name of the module completion predictor. It's available in the gallery. You can install it um, and get it today. Um, it's also open source on GitHub, so any issues and stuff you, you have with it, you're more than welcome to file issues for. And so I'm going to enable it. And so now as I'm typing, so once I do a command, I do a dash, you'll see now that I have two different sources of predictions. I have history and then I have the completion predictor. This is based off of the PowerShell tab completion. So, you know, as you're tabbing through uh, the different parameter options, you know, you might get to the one you want and then, oops, I just accidentally tapped again. And so you have to cycle all the way through again. So this gives you a, a better view, list view of the options available to you and a more uh, exploratory way to new commandlets that you might not have um, used in the past. Um, and so this is really awesome. And so uh, you can do it you know, this way here. Let's see, will this work? Um, there we go. So here's another example of uh, uh, one possible way to use, utilize it. Um, and it works for, for any, any command that you have imported. So um, let's see, get AZVM. It'll work here in just a second. Oh, it should. I was just doing it earlier. Um, but uh, so this is a, a pretty awesome new um, predictor that we've released here. And um, uh, <clears throat> but there, there's a. Uh, also other predictors that are available. So um, another predictor that is uh, actually just GA'd last week is the uh, AZ predictor. So the AZ PowerShell commandlet tools um, can get pretty complicated. And so we want to help you guys out with that uh, and give you guys a predictor that helps give you, um, let's see, did that get, uh, okay, let's do new, there we go, okay. So you'll see here now I have history, and then on the right, of course, is the source of where these predictors are coming from. And so now you can see these different uh, predictions for um, that the AZ uh, predictors uh, plugin has uh, has given you. And so this is pretty awesome if you are new to a lot of these commandlets. Um, and so once you select it, oh, there we go. Um, uh, yeah, so it, it helps you explore this way um, the new AZ command list. But what's really cool is that we have um, recently created more documentation around uh, how to create a predictor yourself. And so that is something we recently um, published here. So we have created a whole set of documentation to help you create your own command line predictors. Because it's not just AZ and it's not just you know the tab completion predictors. There's, there's graph, there's the PNP module, there's you know, all sorts of these modules with hundreds and hundreds of commandlets, and you're never going to be able to memorize all of them. And so uh, enabling predictors for, uh, you know, folks to create for their own modules and their own uses is really helpful for understanding and exploring what's new and um, being able to, uh, um, you know, help accelerate and enhance your, your console coding experience. And so here, uh, Big shout out to Dongbo Wang on the PowerShell team and Jason for, for getting this going. Um, we uh, have created a very simple sample predictor that uh, gives you a hello world um, as the base predictor. So uh, go on and take a look at it. Uh, we have a aka.ms link, uh, aka.ms uh, slash PS predictor doc. Uh, you guys can check it out there. I believe I have that on the slide too. But um, yeah, anything, I, anything I've missed with the predictors? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's it. Sure. 
how you discover the predictors. Yes. Yeah, so the, sh the predictors ship as modules. You can publish them as modules. And um, oh, another thing I forgot to mention is we'll display them based on the order of import. So um, if I'm doing here, you know, get az v vm, and I do a dash, you'll see that I have three predictors here. I have the history, the completion, and the az, all the predictors we have currently. And so um, you'll also note that I imported the completion predictor first. And if I go back and start a fresh new and enable the az predictor first, then that will be uh, kind of put there, but we do currently have history as the top one, as that's kind of um, what we've decided is the uh, what you want the the quickest access to. But of course, you're able to disable history if you want to see all the different predictor sources uh, from all the plugins you you import. So, um, yeah, got it. So, so the question was around the ordering of the of the what's predicted and what's given. So it's it's really up to the predictor of what um, you know. I can't speak upon how the AZ predictor has exactly uh, decided the ordering of it. I do not believe that the completer predictor is not alphabet alphabetized. I think it's just based on the documentation for it. I don't know, Jason, if you have a better answer for that. Yeah, yeah. PS read line repo is definitely the, the best place to provide it. And um, yeah, I, I mean, we also have the completion repo itself, com completion predictor, uh, GitHub repo. Um, so the predictor is written in C sharp, but if you, if you if your module is written in C sharp, I believe you can kind of implement it within the module that you you currently maintain. Yeah. So, so the question was about different multiple storage, and this is a problem we've been talking about for months. <laughs> it's 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 a really tricky problem, and something that we've been. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so so it, it's been tricky because for the past you know couple months as we've been developing it, we've only had two predictors, and until this week we 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 only had two, and now we have three. And so now we're starting to ask ourselves the question of, okay, how many, if we have n predictors, what, what does that problem look like? Is it enabling, you know, different kinds of sorting ways or, um, you know, what, what would work best for your guys' case? Oh, yeah. But if that's something you're interested in for the predictors that we maintain, you know, yeah, uh, feedback is, is highly appreciated. Um, okay. What do you guys think of predictors? Pretty cool. Um, so yeah, here's the last plug. You know, if you want to create your own predictor, aka.ms slash PS predictor uh, doc, it will take you straight there and we look forward to seeing what you guys create. So thank you. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Steven. Awesome. So I think our goal here was to try and finish our slides by 1.30 so that we could leave some time for Q&A. Um, the good news is that I recognize a lot of faces in the audience and so I think I can go a little bit speedy through um, my couple sections right here, and then still give us some time for questions so you guys can kind of guide exactly what's most interesting that we want to talk about a little bit more. Um, so for starters, wanted to um, mention some big updates we've been doing to the PowerShell extension for Visual Studio Code. Um, how many VS Code users we got in the audience? Now, where are my ISC people at? Really? Wow, well that's pretty cool. Um, definitely the first conference where I've gotten that reaction so far. I think just in general, I've noticed a lot of VS Code usage um, going on and I think I can give one possible hypothesis as to one reason why that might be the case and that's we've spent the last two years um, really investing in the reliability and the stability of the extension. And um, in fact, we, we did this major rewrite kind of project to fix some of the architectural challenges with the extension and we shipped that in preview, in our preview extension um, about six months ago. And then since then, um, with our wonderful 10,000 monthly preview users, we've been working out the kinks and the bugs. Um, if you follow the project closely, you'll know that we hit an RC last week and we're really gunning for the, the GA to announce today. Um, we have a few more bugs, or one last bug, one last race condition um, that just got shipped as an update earlier today. Um, so GA is coming very, very soon on that, but unfortunately not today. Um, if you are wondering what's next after the, we make that big release, two years worth of changes um, to our stable extension, our focus is really kind of staying the same. Um, we're focusing on the reliability of this extension, the reliability when you're debugging, when you start up, especially in lockdown environments. We're focusing on the consistency, things like references and the overall experience. 
insights and awareness, better understanding what's actually going on in the extension for us. And then we're dabbling in the intelligence stuff with some of the predictors and how can we integrate the predictors that we just talked about in the console host experience with our experience hosted in Visual Studio Code. So that's a little taste of just what's, what's going on there. If you're curious about more about any of these things or any of the things I talked about, always going to point you to our GitHub repo, repo github.com um, slash PowerShell slash PowerShell dash VS Code, I believe, will get you there. And these are right now organized in projects, so you can see exactly what we're working on when. Um, but the short, answer, the short of it is that, you know, lots of improvements happening there. Keep filing your bugs. We really appreciate it. The other thing I was going to talk to you a little bit about was secret management and secret store. Um, how many of you guys use, have used secret management before? Okay, cool, cool. So some, some, but not quite as many. And for those of you, um, are you guys secret store, other vaults? Other vaults, cool. So what secret management is, is a module that allows you to use a single set of commandlets, like get secret, to access secrets across multiple vaults. Um, and so the idea is, right, like we live in this messy world, we all operate in settings across multiple applications and providers, and we need all these different secrets. And so how can we separate the configuration of my secrets from my actual script so that I'm not needing to necessarily edit my script every time I'm in a new environment and need to edit my uh, ways to authenticate or my ways to access secrets. So we created secret management. It's an extensible model. So we also shipped it with secret store. Um, secret store is a... Um, team, PowerShell team owned slash community owned, of course it's open source, module that allows you to have a secret local, a secret store, a secret local vault um, that's available wherever you ship PowerShell or wherever you use PowerShell. And it has a number of configuration settings that really optimize it for uh, places where you might need secrets with PowerShell. Um, there also are a number of other community vaults out there. Um, if you run, use the tag secret management on the gallery, you'll see a whole bunch pop up um, that other folks from the community have built. Um, definitely check them out, and so you can use all of those today. There's also documentation and resources out there. If you're like, hey, this vault I love to use is not available um, to build your own secret vault. A secret vault is just a, a module. So with that, I was planning on doing a little demo into getting started with secret store and secret management. Can do that, but first I'll just um, do our kind of next closing slide so you all have, know all the options that you can choose from um, when you decide to ask questions and tell us where you want to go. So talked about some lots of exciting things that have already shipped or are shipping very soon. And there's, of course, lots more innovation happening in the tooling space that we chose not to talk to today because we had 30 minutes and um, haven't seen you all in three years. So um, there is a lot of work happening on PowerShell Get v3 right now. Major rewrite project there also started about two years ago. We're on preview 13, which is coming soon. Happy to answer more questions about that. Work is continuing on the PowerShell gallery um, to kind of meet the rising scale needs of the gallery. Um, I don't know if how many of you guys go to the gallery regularly, but right now I think we have um, around 5 billion something downloads. Um, so definitely the scale is growing there quickly. Um, work in this year is also happening on Platypus 2.0, and as we mentioned, many more community predictors, hopefully from all of y'all. So with that, Wrapping up to questions, um, happy to take questions on any of that, or if you'd like, we can do a little demo on Secret Store getting started. Secret Store? Cool. Sounds good. All right, so let's do this. Um, I'm just going to use VS Code, go here. Sounds like all of y'all use VS Code, but in case you don't, um, it's free online, install it cross-platform. We have, as I mentioned, two PowerShell extensions, PowerShell and PowerShell Preview. There's also a number of other community PowerShell mod or extensions as well. Um, Preview is what I would use right now. Um, I would say it's, it's more stable than stable because of all the improvements we made. I've already shipped there, but coming very soon to stable. So anyways, with that, um, I'll do a little GMO, Microsoft's Microsoft PowerShell secret. 
list available. All right, you'll see that I have two modules installed right now. So I have secret store and secret management. These are the two modules you are gonna wanna grab to get started. Of course, both available on the PowerShell gallery, both compatible back to Windows PowerShell 5.1. So once I do that, I can run get secret vault. And you'll see that it returns nothing because I have no secret vault registered so far. So my first step is gonna be to register my first secret vault. So register secret vault, name, name is a friendly name that I can call it whatever I want, my vault. Module name is gonna be the module name for the vault extension. So I'll do Microsoft PowerShell secret store. Um, some vaults require vault parameters um, to get started. I think AZ, for example, has some vault parameters so it, it can get you all configured right with your Azure Key Vault. Um, we don't need any for Secret Vault, but I am going to use this flag as my default vault. If I set it as my default vault, I don't need to provide the vault name every time I grab a secret from it. It's cool, so we got that registered. So let's try running that again. All right, cool, you can see that I have my vault, Secret Store, true. So with that, um, we can get started and set our first secret. So if I run Get Secret Info, it's gonna return secret metadata so I can see which secrets I have registered. And since this is my first time using Secret Vault, it's gonna prompt me to create a password for my Secret Vault. So by default, Secret Vault uses a password to access it. You can turn this feature off. It's also configurable how often you'd like it to prompt you um, in various ways where you can provide a password. But for now, I'll just provide a password Ask, enter my password again for verification. All right, let's run get secret info again. Not gonna return anything because I don't have any secrets set so far. So with that, I can use set secret to create my first secret. For name, I'll call it, I don't know, my secret. Um, and then you can provide the secret. Here you can provide it as a, oh. Um, you can provide your secret here. You can provide it in various different ways as a PS credential object. You can provide it as a string if you, if you really wanted to, as a secure string. Also, if you don't provide the secret parameter and you just type, it'll prompt you for a secure string um, interactively as well. Um, so I'll just call this. Provide my secret there. I've set it, have it set now. And so now if I run get secret info again, okay, now we have a secret, my secret. It's a secure string, that's the default if it prompts you at the command line, um, and you can see my vault name. So now when I need that secret, I just run get secret, my secret, and it should return for me. If I wanted to see it as plain text option as well, sometimes that's required interactively when you're providing a secret, say, um, in a script. That's my secret right there. So that's a really, really quick um, getting started with secret store. Um, if we do a get command on the module, let's just show both modules really quick. So let's do secret management first. Cool, so you can see the full command interface here. I showed you most of these. So we have get secret, get secret info, um, which once again, get secret returns to secret info metadata. Um, get secret vault, register, you can remove secrets, um, you can set secrets, you can set secret info, so we do have um, an option to set the secret uh, metadata as well for secret store, so if you, if you need a information, say, about the life cycle of the secret, you can provide that there as well. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of secret management. I'll just do the same thing for secret store so that you can see the secret store um, commandlets themselves. So any um, vault extension can have whatever commandlets it wants, right? In addition to interfacing with secret management. So these are gonna be different ways you're gonna be able to configure the vault itself. Um, this has various configuration options. So you can like reset your to your default configuration. You can set the password. We showed the password, how that comes up. Unlock is a, is a way you can unlock your secret store for a set amount of time that you declare so that you can access secrets while you need them. And that is about it. That is very basic getting started with secret management. Yay! <laughs> So yeah, I think that secret management was um, a really great example of 
um, sort of the development process that we have today with our community. Um, it was one where we, I think we I announced it, we announced it as a team back in like fall of 2019 and went through many preview releases and like many times getting it wrong and getting community feedback and eventually getting it right. Um, and we shipped it last spring, um, but since we haven't gotten to see y'all in person, wanted to share it a little bit there as well. Um, but with that, I guess any questions about any, really anything, honestly, anything PowerShell related or not, um, happy to answer. I'm not sure how much time we have. We have, we are exactly at time, but I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. It uses um, some like .NET encryption. Yeah, so for each vault that you want, you're going to have to install the extension vault, register it, and then you're off to the races. I, I don't necessarily have that prepared. I mean, the, the simple right is like you're going to want to install the module and then register. Um, so I, it shouldn't be too overly complicated. Um, let's see, did we have the name of it? Did it show up here? HashiCorp.vault.kv. Um, yeah, I guess I don't know how much value there is in me typing, okay. installing it here, but yeah. It's, it, and I would just say also go to the vault extension owner. It's a community owned vault, so um, they should be able to provide you more like getting started steps, but should be just two lines really. Yeah. Anything else on absolutely anything you want to ask the PowerShell team? That's cool too. Um, I know that we give you guys plenty of opportunities for feedback, which of course, like, you could always count on me to plug as well. Um, come engage with us in our 102 active GitHub repositories. <laughs> we are we are there. We live there and um, are always happy to get your feedback. Always want to plug. You don't have to be an expert to open your first GitHub issue with us. In fact, if you're not, all the better. We need your feedback. Um, join us on our monthly community call, third Thursday of every month at 930 Pacific time, aka.ms slash join PS call. And in our RFC repo, you'll find an issue that's opened um, in advance of every call if you want specific topics to be addressed. But also just come in and ask your question. But we'll see you around. Um, enjoy the rest of your conference.